Are you all ready for the word? Yes. Brilliant. So we're going to come to the word. We're still busy with Christ formed in you. Can you believe it? It's been over a year I've been preaching this. Over a year. Isn't it incredible how the Word is so full of material, so full of stuff? But isn't it amazing that there are times when you go to your Bible and you pick it up and it's like, what do I read? What do I study? What do I... But, you know, times like this now, one year on a Christ formed in you, you realize, man, there is a wealth of truth in the Word of God. Amen? So, I want to... Just continue with it and just share another aspect of it this morning. So we've been starting the last several messages with this statement. We are so ordinary, yet an extraordinary Holy Spirit has been poured out on us. So which makes you extraordinary. Amen. So there's no Christian life without the Holy Spirit. I love it. Jerry Bridges says the sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the transformation. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us whereby our inner being is progressively changed, freeing us more and more from sinful traits and developing within us over time the virtues of Christ-like character. How powerful is that? And uh, James Augury says this, holiness consists of three things. Number one, separation from sin. Number two, dedication to God. Number three, transformation into Christ's image. He says we cannot talk about the last one unless we have implemented the first two. Is that okay? That the transformation into the nature of Christ requires, prerequisite to that, requires us to separate ourselves from sin and to dedicate ourselves to God. So we looked at some of the actions and activities of the Holy Spirit. Amongst others, He fills us, He teaches us, He reminds us, He guides or leads us. He searches the deep things of God. He enlightens us. And the last time I preached, two weeks ago, He intercedes for us. Isn't that awesome? He intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. But this morning I want to go to Romans chapter 8 verse 16, New King James Translation. Let's just go to Romans chapter 8 verse 16 and we'll see another verb describing an activity and an action of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a ministry to us. A ministry to us. He's a minister. He ministers things to us. And we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says this. The Spirit itself beareth witness. That's the King James. If we can just try the new King James, it's just a little bit easier to understand. More or less the same, but that's fine. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Everybody say with. Okay, so I'm going to read it again. I want you to just log it. You know, in your mind, underline and italicize and put in bold the word with. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Come on, that should make you excited right there. Eh? The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are now are children of God. I mean, that is, it's just so powerful. You know that it's so different, this activity of the Holy Spirit, is so different to His initial, to His first ministry to us. Because before we got saved, He convicted us. Are you with me? And that convicting work was to show us who we were, what state we were in, and who we needed, and why. And Jesus says it like it's in John 16, 8 to 11, and he was talking about the Holy Spirit, and he said, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. That's John 16, verse 8. 
and of righteousness and of judgment. So there was three things that the Holy Spirit initially, His first ministry to us, was to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John goes on to explain it. He says, of sin because they do not believe in me. In other words, then you remain in your sin. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Which means that the Father will accept and receive me, which then validates everything I said, proving me righteous. My message is true. And number three, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Which is not only the devil, but the law, because it ruled that world. And God said, it's not judged, it's out. And that was his first role. And then we accepted Jesus. His role immediately changes. Instantaneously. When we've accepted Jesus, Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, we shall be saved. And when we do it, the Holy Spirit starts to minister something else to us. He starts to witness with our spirit that we are sons of God, children of God. You know that some people have said that Paul was sexist because, you know, he says there the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But the earlier verse it says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So they said, you know, Paul, he comes from that paternalistic, male chauvinistic, sexist era. And that's why some Bible translators, to fit in with the modern world, put children there because they say it's ladies and gentlemen. But the fact that he mentions a son is really significant because it was only the male child, the firstborn, that would inherit. Then he goes on. So even in that statement, he's not being sexist. He's saying because, you know, men and women become sons of God in that they are in line for the inheritance. Are you all good? All right. So now how does he, how does he witness with our spirit? There's some components to it, and I want to just unpack it, and we'll go for as long as we need to go. If it starts to get too much, I could just cut it off and, hey, guess what we got next Sunday? Wow. That's awesome, eh? So he bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There is no more miserable, there is no sadder Christian than the one who is a Christian but doesn't know they're a Christian. In other words, they don't know that they 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 know that they're a Christian. There's no assurance of salvation. There's no conviction that I confessed with my mouth because I believed in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and I'm saved. And I confess my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive me from, you know, of all my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm born again. He's my father. And there are so many Christians that struggle with that for decade upon decade yeah. upon decade. A lot of it's to do with the religious preaching that we had because it was almost like the way that it was inferred that was that Every time you sinned, you were out of Christ. Every time, you know, you pulled a fist at the taxi, suddenly you were removed from Christ and you were unsaved and you needed to get saved again and and all of this kind of thing. And so it was an inferred thing. It was a subconscious thing. And it's like, oh, I'm just such a sinner. and I I just blew it again this week. And oh, Jesus, you know. And yes, we feel sorry for our sin, but it does not divorce us from Christ. We are not removed out of Him. Amen. I am still His son. I might be a naughty son, but I'm still His son. Is that okay? I might need a paddywhack on the seat of my understanding, but I'm still His son. You're still His son. Hallelujah. And so, you know... The Holy Spirit then begins his post-salvation ministry, and that is to witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. When Paul gets to this point in the book of Romans, he's already mentioned so much of the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives. So much. So without reading, and let me just tell you, you will know from your knowledge of reading Romans chapter 8, because I'm sure you all read it this week, or you've read it recently because I've been preaching, I don't know. So anyways, so... Christians walk by the Spirit, Romans 8 verse 4. They think on the things of the Spirit, 
verse 5. And that mind of the Spirit is life and peace, verse 6. Christians do not belong to the flesh, and hence they are able to please God, verses 7 to 9. They are of the Spirit, and so belong to Christ, verse 9. The Spirit is the one who gives life, despite the mortality of their present bodies, verses 10 to 11. Christians, therefore, are obligated by the Spirit to put to death the evil deeds of the body, and we're unable to do that. And then Paul continues with his instruction to say, and now, guess what? As you're walking in all of that, the Holy Spirit witnesses with your spirit, along with your spirit, that you're a son of God. You see, sonship is a divine gift. And that divine gift qualifies us for an eternal, heavenly, spiritual inheritance. We are heirs of God. So, the nature of the adoption, Paul speaks about it when he contrasts a little bit earlier and he says, you have not received the spirit of fear or bondage again to fear. Because that was the condition that we were in before we accepted Jesus. Because Paul makes it clear, the person without Christ is dead. And we were in bondage to fear, slaves to basic principles. And then Paul talks about the fact that when the Holy Spirit comes in our lives, we are made alive in Christ. We are born again into the kingdom. He becomes our heavenly Father. And the Holy Spirit is there constantly, constantly witnessing to your spirit that you're a child of God. Okay, good. So let's read Romans 8, 12 to 17. Are you all good? Is it okay? Can we read it? Romans 8, 12 to 17, New King James Translation says, Therefore, brothers, whenever you see the therefore, you need to ask yourself, why is the therefore? Or what is the therefore? It's because of what's previously been said. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's pretty emphatic, eh? Don't be fleshly Christians, because it brings death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. By whom? By the Spirit. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Of God, And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Because He's the firstborn Son. He gets the inheritance. But God in His grace joins us to Him. We therefore share in the inheritance of the firstborn. Isn't that awesome? And then it goes on to say, If indeed we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified with Him. That's the one part that we don't like to read. Let me just read it again and mention it again. Paul says these things are conditional on this, that if we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. In other words, is that if you take the persecution, take the resistance, take the, you know, swimming upstream against the tide of the spirit of this age, you know, you're going for it and, you know, you are belittled, you are ridiculed, you are ignored, whatever else, you're not recognized, Just like they did with Jesus. So if we suffer with Christ, we'll also be glorified with Him. Hallelujah. Let's just talk about it now. Let's just put Romans 8 verse 16 back on the screen. Let's just have a look at it as we just continue to unpack it. The witness of the Spirit to our Spirit. But to be more precise, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. 
you could say to our spirit, but with our spirit, that we are children of God. How does he witness to our sonship? How does he testify to our sonship? How does he do that? And um, we will we'll have a look at this. The first thing that the Holy Spirit does in bearing witness of our sonship is that he gives us a taste of the fullness that is to come. And I love what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 6. From the back end of chapter 5, he goes on in chapter 6 to talk about you know, meat is for the mature, you know, it's for those who understand the righteousness of God in Christ, that kind of thing. And it comes to Hebrews chapter 6 and he talks about, therefore, let's leave these elementary teachings about Christ. It's an amazing, resurrecting the dead, he says, is elementary. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Let's do some elementary stuff. All right. Now I'm going to read from verse 3. So you know the background. 3 to 5. He says, you know, I'll go on to explain this and and that kind of thing. He says, and this we will do if God permits. Now here it comes. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and of the powers of the age to come. He says that if they fall away, Uh, to come back to repentance. That's not just if you backslide. That's if you knowingly reject the way of salvation, which a lot of the Jews were doing. But notice what he says. Let's go back to verse 5. He says, they've tasted of the powers of the age to come. Now, without laboring, let me just try and explain. The New Testament writers were anticipating the new age. The new age would be the third world. The first world was the world from Adam up to Noah. That world was destroyed by a flood. The second world was from Noah onwards until the time of Jesus. But in particular, God was patient for another 40 years. AD 70, the world, the second world of the Jews was destroyed when Jerusalem with its temple was destroyed. That was the end of the second world. And all of the New Testament writers were anticipating it because Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 24 extensively. Chapter 10, 16, and then, you know, you know all the way through to chapter 25. It's all in the book. Just a little plug for the book. All right, so it's all in the book. So in other words, they were all looking. That's why when Jesus spoke about the coming destruction of the temple, one of the questions that the disciples asked is, when will be the end of the world? It didn't end America's world or China's world. or It ended that world of the Jewish people. And they were anticipating another age to come. So he was saying, you know, Paul was saying to those around him, we've already tasted of the fullness of what will happen post AD 74 when the kingdom is finally fully established. And the whole legal law system of Moses is taken away. He said, we've already tasted, we're tasting it now. That's the context. But I believe we can expand it. Because Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 2. He talks about the unfolding of the coming ages. And I believe, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the conference. I believe is that as time goes, God is unfolding revelation. Amen. Amen. And more and more, because of what we've tasted, we can anticipate fuller things and the fullness of the Spirit. So that's part of his work. That's part of what he does. I think I've explained that okay. All right. So the whole of the Old Testament, or not the whole of, but many places in the Old Testament, the prophets anticipated a coming era of the Spirit that was far beyond what they had experienced. And they knew it would be in the last days. In other words, when the Messiah came. How many of you know? It's all in the book. It's in the book. The last days began when Jesus was born. Okay. 
And they knew that in the last days, when the Messiah would come, he would come with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So they were anticipating that age to come. And Isaiah, it's really incredible. If you go through Isaiah 4, 2 to 4, he spoke about the coming branch that would cleanse Jerusalem by the spirit of judgment and in fire. Chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, the spirit of the Lord would rest on this shoot that sprouts from the stem of Jesse. Isaiah 42, verse 1, God would put his spirit on his chosen servant. Isaiah 61, verse 1, Isaiah prophesies that when the Messiah comes, this is what he will say. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news. And so, accordingly, the Holy Spirit was instrumental in the conception of Jesus, in his baptism, in all of the miracles that he performed. It was the Holy Spirit that enabled him through the crucifixion and, of course, animated his life again in the resurrection. And all of this was just spelling out for us that the same Spirit that did all of this will work these same things in us. That we can live by the Spirit. Amen? Amen. And are you all with me? I don't know, but I, just, like, I get so excited about this kind of thing. And then to capital, to capital, not only did Jesus function under the power and the ability of the Holy Spirit, not only was the Spirit upon him and anointed him, not only that, but when he is crucified, uh, rises again, ascends into heaven, God takes, I'm putting it in just basic language, God takes the Holy Spirit and gives the Holy Spirit to Jesus, making him both Lord and Christ, so that Jesus now could pour out the Spirit on us. Isn't that amazing? Wow. See, the powers of the age to come. It's amazing. It's amazing. And Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, and chapter 5, verse 5, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 and 4.30. In other words, he tells us of a few activities of the Holy Spirit. It says, God anointed us. God sealed us. God gave His Spirit as a deposit or a down payment, as a guarantee of our full redemption, even when our bodies get saved. Where every cell in our body comes into union with Christ. Yeah. We step out of mortality into immortality. So what we have now is a deposit. It's a down payment. We've been anointed. We've been sealed. You know, that sealing, like the Roman imperial seal, like what they put on the tomb of Jesus, was like, you don't break this, you don't open it, carries behind it is all the might of the Roman Empire. Do not touch. Do not remove. And Paul says, the Holy Spirit has sealed us. In other words, you are protected from destruction by the enemy. In other words, when the devil looks at your life, he sees the seal of the Holy Spirit. He's not allowed to meddle with you. We need to know that. But the other thing about a seal is that it's declaring this as a, the genuine article. So the sealing of the Holy Spirit is going, you're genuine, you're the real deal, you're, the, you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit in you, if you can, you know, if you know the Spirit is in you, if you can speak in tongues, you've got the seal. Amen? And it's a witness to the devil. This dude here, he's the real deal. He's a McCoy. You know, he's a Christian. Hallelujah. Okay. So he just, he just gets us to taste. The, you know. But more than that, he's not satisfied just for us to taste. He wants us to participate in that. We can bring the powers of the age to come closer the more we walk in and with and by the Spirit. So secondly, the Spirit's witness, the Spirit witnesses by in general, in general making the Word of God a reality in our lives, thus proving that all the promises of our do- adoption is also true. So He blesses your giving and you see, man, God is faithful. I said that to someone the other day. If you're tithing and giving offerings, you don't even have to pray and ask God. Because you're doing what He said, He'll bless it anyway. 
Sometimes we pray and we put God in remembrance of our sowing. It's not, he hasn't forgotten. Plenty of scriptures. No, it's to remind ourselves that we've given. For the expectation that we have. Amen. And so when anything in the word is fulfilled, it's the Holy Spirit witnessing to you saying, and even your full adoption shall come to pass. And so it's by the word. It's by the word. Okay, so it's by the word. By the word in its totality. The word depends on the spirit. The spirit inspired the word. The word depends on the spirit to illuminate the word to us. Is that okay? But listen, listen. The word depends on the spirit. Because without the spirit, it's a powerless word. There's a lot of people that read it. And it's powerless to them. Because they are not receiving the ministry of the Holy Spirit, interpreting and applying the word into our lives. And so... It's by the word. How many of you know when you're born again and your spirit goes through that regeneration? It's that deep, mysterious, eternal work of the Holy Spirit who takes your spirit dead in transgressions and sins. And he makes you alive with Christ. Even when you are still dead. And he raises you up and he seats you with Christ at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That mystery of the Spirit, that incredible eternal work, comes about by the Word. So James 1.18, he gives us birth by the Word of truth. 1 Peter 1.23, we've been born again through the living and abiding Word of God. So we're talking about, so just so that, let me just bring you back on track with me is that we're talking about the witness of the Spirit to our spirit. So we've already seen is that what we're enjoying now, the reality of what we're enjoying now, is we're tasting, and hopefully it makes us hungry for the full power of the coming ages. And secondly, this thing about adoption as sons is key and it's central to the doctrine of us as people. Because we're not orphans. Jesus said it. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you comfortless. I go to prepare a place in my Father so that where I am as a son, you can be a son with me in the Father. That's what it, that John chapter 14 means. And so there's many verses. John chapter 1 verse 12. You know, he came to his own and his own received him, not verse 11. But to as many as received him, verse 12, to them he gave the power or the right or the authority to become sons of God. And there's many verses, many verses in the Bible, many verses talking about it. In Galatians 4 and other places, Hebrews 12, many places that talk about it. It's these very scriptures that when we read, the Holy Spirit is witnessing with our spirit, this is you. This is you. This is what you are. This is who you are. He witnesses with our spirit. So it's through the word. So I'm going to say something now, and I want you to get it right. It's not initially a feeling. You know, when the spirit is bearing witness with our spirit that we are sons of God, initially or primarily, it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling that it communicates to us. Because feelings are fickle. You can feel mightier than the Apostle Paul on Sunday morning, sitting in church in the atmosphere. Monday morning when you wake up, you feel like what the Apostle Paul said, me, I'm the chiefest of all sinners. (laughs) Amazing how we can go from one to the other. So it's not a feeling. The feeling comes when we understand what the Word says about us. Then you can rely on the feeling. Then that feeling, because it's founded on the word, is not fickle and doesn't change. And even if you don't feel it, you know it as a sure thing. I'm a son of God. So it's not a feeling. The feelings follow. I remember initially when I, I just, it was like I got born again again at about the age of 14. And... Um, 
Apple service and I'm very, very young. But uh, around about the age of 14, powerful service and I responded, I went forward for prayer and the pastor prophesied over me. And from then, something changed and something happened. Particularly when I got around the age 18, 19, I just became on fire for Jesus. But there was something that plagued me. And that is on Sunday in church, just like I explained, I was one of those. It was like, glory, hallelujah, here's my cup, Lord, <laughs> fill it up, Lord. I mean, we'd be singing all those, come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. I mean, you can't believe it, we used to worship with those songs, but we did. And they were awesome for their time. Amen? And I would be there, I would just feel an invincible Christian. Pastor would give the altar call. I was sitting on the front row on the edge of my seat. Couldn't wait for the altar call. People coming down the front. I would sit there, tears streaming down my face. Thank you, Jesus. People getting saved. More often than not, when I woke up on Monday morning, I was wondering, am I really saved? I promise you, I kid you not. More often than not. And you know what I had to do? I had to educate myself according to the word. I had to educate those feelings and thoughts. I had to educate. I'd go back to the Word and I'd say, Lord, why do I feel like this? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is, you know, is raised from the dead, or Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Lord, I believe in my heart. Do I really believe in my heart? Yes, yes, no, I really believe in my heart. And Lord, I confessed with my mouth. But let me just confess it again. Jesus is Lord. Okay, so I must be saved. And John says, if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I must be saved. And invariably, when I gave myself a good talking to you, I'd stand up and feel like an invincible Christian again before I went to work. What is that? That's the spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. Now, look, this is a really big subject. But let me just throw this out to you now. Because it's bigger than just knowing that you're a Christian and a son of God. It's knowing what a son is. Are you all with me? I've got to say that again. It's not just... Knowing that I'm a son of God as far as my salvation is concerned and I have an assurance that if I was to close my eyes in this life, I'll open my eyes and I'll be looking at Jesus. It's more than that. It's understanding what is a son in the kingdom. What is a son? Amen. Amen. That's the word. Let me just carry on a couple of minutes with this one. Would you go with me to 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 to 12? Are you getting something so far? I'm going to come to like the cracker part now. And I think that's the part where you're all going to be saying, Amen, Hallelujah, thank you Jesus. Okay, so it's coming, we're building to it. But 1 John chapter 5, verse 5, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Show of hands. Just, you know, for my entertainment, for my sake. Show of hands. How many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Just show of hands. Yeah, there's a few unsure. But thank you. Thank you for that. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. You've overcome the world. Everything in the world. The devil, you've overcome it. You've overcome the world. You've overcome it. And let's go on to verse 6. This is he. So, you're talking about Jesus as the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood. Even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. Okay, are you all with me? We know our key verse, Romans 8.16. We got it? The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God, children of God. Here it is. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness. Because the Spirit is truth. Now, what is He bearing witness to? He's bearing witness to the fact that Jesus Christ came by water. He came by water and by blood. But why is he witnessing to that? It's not for God's sake. 
It's not for Christ's sake, because they know it. He's witnessing of the fact that Christ came by water and blood. He's witnessing it to us. And this is a constant. So let's carry on reading. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. I think it's, is it Deuteronomy 19, 15? I think it's Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, where the Torah establishes a principle. Every matter is to be established by two or three witnesses. And here John is saying, listen, I want to just witness to the fact that the water and the blood witness to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. But in fact, there's three witnesses in heaven. Woo! I think that's awesome. He says, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Isn't it interesting to talking about the water? The water is the baptism of Jesus. Isn't it amazing that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all witnessed there at the baptism of Jesus? All right. And he goes, and there are three that bear witness on earth. So in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. On earth, there are three witnesses. He says, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. This is amazing, isn't it? If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. That's why you should never receive the witness of criticism. Because the witness of God is greater. You should never receive the witness of condemnation. Because the witness of God is greater. Don't receive the witness of accusation and lies from the enemy. The witness of God is greater. Man, there's a lot of stuff in this word. I'm just trying to stick to it. But anyway, there it goes. He who believes the Son of God, listen to this. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. Now, I'm going to read that two more times. And then I'm going to quote Romans 8.16 again. Are you all with me? He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. Romans 8.16 The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. The believer has this witness in himself. Yeah. I'll clarify that in the next minute or two. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. Now here's the testimony. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. How many of you have the Son of God? Let's see. Then you have life. This is the witness. This is the testimony that if you have the Son of God, you have eternal life in Him. Is that okay? Good. So this is the witness in you. When did it happen? When you gave your life to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit swung his ministry around and started to convince you instead of convict you. He starts to convince you and starts to say to you, you are now a son of God. You've got this witness in you, in you, in you, that if you have the son, you have eternal life. That's an unshakable thing. It should be an unshakable thing. Amen? I love what one preacher said. One thing for certain. Whenever you're trying to discern what the Spirit is doing, He's always pointing us to Christ. Always. The water and the blood. The three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, Jesus, and the Spirit. On earth, the Spirit comes on earth. And He says, all right, now I'm a witness on earth. I am in heaven, but I'm also a witness on earth. The water the blood. So the water I mentioned is the baptism of Jesus. How many of you know that Jesus wasn't baptized for his own sins? He didn't have any. He was baptized showing us 
what would happen to us if we accept him and we submit to the waters of baptism. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. So through what Jesus did, he witnesses even to our own baptism. That if you are baptized, then you died with him. You were buried with him. You were raised with him. You're a child of God. Amen. Amen. Then, of course, he says the water and the blood, and I'm trying to just save time on this as well. But it's very interesting that you can write it down, John chapter 1, verses 32 and 34, that when John saw Jesus, this is what John says. And John, well, the Gospel of John says about John the Baptist. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water and said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist says it again, And I have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God. So that witness comes out through his baptism. Wow. The blood. Jesus really lived a human life. He really died. He really shed his blood. At the Last Supper, Jesus took the cup, the bread that was present, took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, or the blood of of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Even Jesus held up his, the, the symbol, the emblem of his own blood. It's because of that that we justified. It's because of that blood that we are forgiven of our sins. It's because of that blood. And it's the Holy Spirit that often says to us, look at the blood. It was for you. It was for me. I like it in John chapter 19 verse 35 when the soldiers came to break the legs of those that are crucified. When they walked up they saw Jesus was dead already and they took a spear and pierced his side and the Bible records, John records that blood and water flowed out. Centurion says, surely this was the Son of God. John says this in verse 35. And he who has seen this testifies, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, so that you may believe. You see, when the Spirit witnesses that you're a child of God, he's not just whispering in your spirit, no, 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 just get over yourself, don't feel condemned, you're a child of God. What he does is he always witnesses concerning the water and the blood. What Jesus did for you to make you a son of God. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, so we wrap it up, and this is the last part, and we're nearly done. See, Romans chapter 8 verse 16 was something that I was getting at, and I just saw it now this, the last couple of days when I was preparing. And that is when it says, the Spirit uh, witnesses with our spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak for us. He speaks to us. He bears witness with us. So the Holy Spirit is co-witnessing with the witness that we already have. What is the testimony that we already have? He who has the Son has life. So then he goes, the Holy Spirit then comes along and says, Okay, you see that there? That's the truth. He witnesses with my Spirit. In other words, if I don't have the witness, I need to get the witness by going back to the Word. Then the Holy Spirit comes and He confirms that witness. And then it becomes something that is sure and solid in our lives. Amen? So our own spirit bears witness and then the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit. And then John says this. We can put it into verse 17 now. And if children, no, 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 let's go to verse 15, when he says, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The end result, the end result, the end result, and I should have had more time with this, 
the end result of the Spirit witnessing with our spirit is that from our spirit we can say, Abba, Father. See, there's so much involved in our son. So, Pastor John, what are you trying to say with this? And that's such a significant statement. Is that with the witness of the Holy Spirit, our understanding of God as our Father is not that He's the Father in the general terms because He's Father over all creation. It's much deeper, much more intimate than it is. I am His Son. He is my Father. And He just takes us into this intimacy with Him. Where it's such a revelation. Oh, He's my Father. He's my Father. He's my Father. You know, a lot of preachers wrongly say, it irritates me a little bit, I must admit, you know, that Abba is like Daddy. It's not. Abba is Father. It's Aramaic Father. Father, Father. You look at how many times in the Bible, Eli, Elijah, you know, Jesus on the cross, Elisha, my Father, my Father. Whenever you repeat a thing twice, it's a certainty. So it's that with certainty, that we have a certainty concerning our relationship. We can cry by the Spirit, Father, Father, you're my Father. The intimate part comes when it's not in the term, it's in the understanding of this relationship now. Yeah, yeah. So it irritates the gazoobers out of me when I said, yeah, Papa say, and Daddy says, you know, and Papa. No, he's not Papa, he's Father. Yeah. You, to me, that, all of that's just a little bit too disrespectful. Yeah. For me, I would rather just stick with biblical terms. Yeah. Let's stick with biblical language. If I say, Father, with a revelation, that's intimacy. I don't have to say, Daddy, Papa, say, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, help me. It smacks up immaturity and familiarity. That's, yeah, amen. Okay, let's just leave that. Let's just leave that. Let's just leave that. Let's just leave that. Closing. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Paul says, Therefore I made known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. Impossible if you're speaking by the Spirit of God to say, Jesus, be accursed. But he goes on to say, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. Now, if you went up to an atheist and an unbeliever and said, can you say Jesus is Lord? They would say, yeah, sure, Jesus is Lord. They can, without the Holy Spirit. But they can't say, Jesus is Lord, meaning it, without the Holy Spirit. And without understanding and so what is Paul trying to tell us now in this verse, putting it together with that verse in 1 Corinthians 12, is that when the Spirit bears witness to our spirit, because we really have the testimony, and he goes, yes, this is a reality. The revelation hits, and it's like, wow. Then we speak by the Spirit, Abba, Father. That's not a once for all. That's an ongoing thing. Every now and again, I'm overwhelmed by the fact that God is my Father. Jesus is my brother. You know why some people are so bold and they can do miracles and they can stand against persecution and all this? Because they have this witness of the Spirit. They know who they are. They can do great exploits. They know who they are. They know who their Father is. Out of shadow of a doubt. Out of shadow of a doubt. They are convinced and persuaded of it. Let's bow our heads as we close. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need this ministry of yours. We need your persuasive, convincing, witnessing to our spirit with our spirit speaking alongside us just like you do when we are in travail groaning we who have the first fruits of the spirit 
are travailing and groaning for our full adoption. We're groaning, but you're supplying the groans. We have the witness. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. The life is in the Son. Anyone who has the Son has a life. Oh, Father, this is the witness that we have in our spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come along and you speak along with us. And you say, you are a son. You are an adopted son, fully maturing. Holy Spirit, would you continue to testify on earth what is being testified in heaven. Would you continue to speak concerning the water and the blood, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that we might believe and by believing we might have life fully in His name. Holy Spirit, please, would you continue to minister to us, to witness with our spirit, even with groans inexpressible, persuading us, aligning us to the truth of full sonship. Father, Father, I pray this in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. And we all agreed and said, Amen. Amen.